Uh, my name is Marco Hansen. I'm in Austin right now. I'm from Brownsville, Texas. And um, today I'm at uh, the offices of Texan Translation. And we have Austin and Houston offices. And when I was in Houston a couple months ago, I got together with my friend and colleague, Dr. Ray Romero, and talked about interpreter education and translation education. And I've just put a link in the chat with um, one of the pages for the programs that he's in charge of at the University of Houston downtown. And some of those are available as um, remote um, online um, training. Others are in person, others are hybrid, and he can give us more details on that. But I would just encourage you, if you're looking for a way to advance your career in interpretation or translation to the next level, to look at the UHD offerings. They're, they're pretty comprehensive and um, include both uh, medical and uh, legal content. Um, today, I feel like um, autopsies are sort of a crossover between medical and legal because it's creating a legal document, but based on medical research. And so I'm really looking forward to learning more about this. I've never translated an autopsy report myself, but Dr. Romero has done a lot of these. And so um, without further ado, I'll turn things over to you, Ray. And if you have questions as we go along, just feel free to put them in the chat and either um, in a pause or at the end, we'll come back around and answer all of those. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marco. How much time do I have? Well, we have an hour blocked off for this, so let's shoot for the end of the hour. But if it goes over, I've got some free time. And, and Okay. I, I think I timed it for 45 minutes, but it might go... And that will give us time for questions. And there's an activity at the end that we can do. OK, thank um, you. So thank you for the introduction. Um, like uh, Mr. Hansen said, um, I sort of became um, interested in, in autopsy reports by pure accident. When I was a grad student in DC, I worked for a company who was a contractor for the Department of Justice. and so. They had um, they had a, a lot of documents related to drug overdose, and and in the beginning, I was doing uh, quite a lot of those, especially about drug trafficking. And at some point, they gave me an autopsy report, and I don't know whether it is because I they liked the way I did it or just because I did a lot of research for it. But after a while, that's all I ever got. They only sent me autopsy reports, and I kind of became like the autopsy report guy. And so, like he said, I've done quite a lot of quite a quite a bit of these, um, mostly from English into Spanish, and that's kind of how this happened. And I think that's interesting because when you work as a translator, you really never know uh, in what area you're going to become specialized. And you know, specialization comes through expertise and getting the correct feedback. That's how you become a spe specialized in, in something. And so that's how that's how this happened. Uh, it was not something that I planned. And, uh, you know, for a while, being a grad student, you know, you always kind of show our money. So it kind of became my bread and body about our autopsy report. So that's how I ended up here. Um, it, it, uh, it was just something I was pigeonholed to doing and I was more than happy to do it. So that's that's where this is coming from. Um, let's see. So we're going to talk about the autopsy report as a text. Uh, we're going to talk about it as a translated text. The autopsy report is a linguistic domain. I'm going to go through all these terms. And then at the end, we have time. Uh, we'll do a summative activity, which I hope uh, uh, Marco has sent to you, uh, a Word document with um, several exercises. So first of all, uh, an autopsy report, is it a document or a record? Does anyone know? It's an autopsy, it's a, it's, a, it's a record, like I said there, but what is the difference between a document and a record? I think I see a couple of answers in the chat. Okay, technically it is both, but it's a little bit more of one than the other. So it is actually um, a record. And the difference between a document and a record, they both provide information, but a record can be used as evidence in the court of law. So this is why this is it's important. Um, it, it has a very important function in the judicial system. Um, also, a record happens after the event, so it's not a, it's not an ever changing document. It's 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 done 
after something happened, they record something that happened. It's immutable, which means that it cannot change. You cannot go back and change it. Uh, it has legal and societal weight, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And the ads report together with the death certificate and the investigator's report, they're all interrelated in, in that they pretty much uh, detail the scene investigation. You know, what was the, the investigation that was conducted when, I, when, um, when um, a death which resulted from a crime uh, occurred. And they all depend on each other. For instance, you need an autopsy report in order to do a death certificate. You know, so it, it is part of, a, and you need an investigator's report in order to do an autopsy report. So they're all interrelated. What is the life cycle? So first, uh, we'll talk about the creation. Who gets to author an autopsy report? After it's been created, it needs to be approved. Uh, in other words, then there are some signatures, some seals that need to be stamped. Some officials need to um, you know, give it the green light that it was done correctly. Then it can be released. We're going to talk about under which circumstances it can be released. And then finally, it can be archived. And it can be there as part of uh, a file, criminal file, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. If I'm going really fast, please let me know. I know sometimes I, I tend to go a little fast, you know, just let me know, go a little slow. And I think uh, this recording will be available on YouTube. So if you want to come back and watch later and take, take a little more notes, feel free. Yes, it will. So who authors an autopsy report? Well, there are maybe two or three people that can actually do that. And I'll, I put the medical examiner and the forensic pathologist under the same category and explain that why in a minute. So it can be either a medical examiner or a coroner. And we'll talk about the differences. So the main difference here is with a coroner is that the coroner does not need to have a medical degree. Now, in some jurisdictions, in some counties, they might put that as a prerequisite, but in most cases, it is not. You do not need to have a medical degree to become a coroner. You're actually elected. So people get to vote for you, um, which means you get to have a party affiliation, you know, Republican, Democrat, Independent, et cetera. And so sometimes, um, in, especially in jurisdictions that are quite small, they may actually have double duties. For instance, they can be the coroner and the county sheriff. And it happens quite often in that many times they, they, it's almost like, a, like an afterthought. You know, it's almost like someone who already has duties assigned to them. And then all of a sudden, they also get elected as a coroner. They get to determine whether or not an autopsy is needed. So they may not actually conduct the autopsy themselves, but they get to determine whether or not it should be needed. So they make uh, that um, that judicial choice, right? They, they can hire a medical examiner. Sometimes a medical examiner may work for that county, or they actually can outsource the job uh, to many different companies out there who they decide that that's what they do. They do forensic pathology, or they do medical, it could be a company of medical examiners, and then they get that job from the county. And so it's up to the coroner to not only decide whether or not an autopsy will be needed, and if it's needed, uh, who to send that responsibility to in case that there is no county medical examiner. The only prerequisites to be a coroner then is that you need to be 18 years or older, have no felonies, and you need to be electable. That's it. Actually, any of us can become coroners, so I urge you to look into that. <laughs> I said... It's, it's quite easy to become a coroner. There are not a lot of qualifications. The difference between that and a forensic pathologist and a medical examiner is that medical examiners and forensic pathologists actually have medical degrees. They, are actually have, they actually are MDs. The medical examiner completes the death certificate uh, that determine whether or not more, a more detailed autopsy is needed. They also serve as a liaison between law enforcement and public health. For instance, if um, this particular person died from a very um, rare disease, especially a rare communicable disease, 
then uh, they, they, they will work with public health agencies in order to release this information. And that's also how many times we get to know about all these uh, trans transmittable diseases. Um, they're the first ones who get to find out, like, oh, we had three cases of Ebola in Dallas, or we had a couple cases, hundred couple cases of uh, COVID, for instance, right? This is how they first began to find out about uh, the epidemic. And they also sometimes work as a liaison with family members and family members are very important uh, in an autopsy, you know, explain that in a little bit uh, in, in a couple of slides. The forensic pathologist is a little bit more uh, specialized. They have additional training and certification in ballistics, toxicology, you know, examine the gunshot wounds, uh, conduct analysis or, or any of the chemicals obtained from the body. And I'm gonna go through that as well. Uh, they also get to conduct the autopsy. They establish the cause and manner of death and they also get to testify in court. And so as you can tell, ideally, if you want the best person to be doing this kind of work, you should be a forensic pathologist. And that's also how it works in many, uh, places like in Europe, even Latin America, you actually get to have someone who is not just an MD, but someone with a specialized training in ballistics, toxicology, and other areas that they're the ones who get to do the autopsy uh, reports, the autopsy of themselves. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. Let me look at the chat. I think I have three comments. Okay, so Marco, you put a hand up. Thank you. Sure. What will be the translation of coroner? We're going to talk about that in a minute towards the end of the presentation. Okay. So, as you can tell, it's no surprise that since 1857, and I kid you not, since right after the, no, this is before the Civil War, uh, physicians, doctors have been trying to abolish the coroner system because these are people that get to decide whether or not an autopsy is it's required but they have absolutely no training, no medical training. Um, and the other, the other issue is that on, on top of having this almost system for hundreds of years, on top of that, we have a scarcity of uh, board certified forensic pathologists. In the United States, there are only about 500 uh, board certified forensic pathologists. And, and it's just this dearth, this lack of, of professionals who specialize in this field mainly has to do because they receive over half the salary than other specialties, you know, than other MDs. So a lot of very few people actually go into this area. They actually depend on state funds for their salary. And so this position that is very specialized and very important and, and plays a key function in, in the crime investigation, you know, it's it's underfunded and there's just not enough of them. Um, so as you can see, the, in, in this is a, a little old. This is from 2004, so 20 years ago. I don't think it's changed that much, uh, but about 752 death investigation offices had either a medical examiner or a forensic pathologist. And the great majority, you know, about 1,500, um, 1600 almost, we're using uh, just the coroner system. So it, it is quite, um, quite an issue. I think I have a map. Okay, there's the map. So this map shows pretty much in the United States. And actually this map is from 2019. So it's updated on the, the data I just gave you. As you can see here in Texas, we have district medical examiners. So we're, we're in pretty good shape, but other states have other, other rules. As you can see, most of the Midwest and Idaho and Nevada, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Indiana, they have only coroner offices. That's all they got. And then uh, about half the country has a mixture of medical examiners and coroner offices and Everyone else is just, it's a, it's a different combination. But as you can see, um, every state kind of does their own thing. And sometimes every county does their own thing. So does anyone know? I was going to ask one of the questions was, uh, what kind of system do we have in Harris County? 
in um, in Houston, but as you can see, we have medical examiners at the district level. Um, so, you know, look at the map and see where you are. Uh, what what kind of system do they have? You know, it is it is important because if you get to translate an autopsy report from those areas, um, how the report is written, the kind of information that is written, the detail of information that is written will depend on who wrote it. And that depends on their qualifications. Chat real quick. What is the current qualification for forensic pathologists? We're going to talk about that in a minute. I like the questions in the chat. These are oh, this is all material we're going to see in a couple of slides. So my question is: Do you think there's a difference in the quality and thoroughness of autopsy report authored by a coroner versus a forensic pathologist? I think we discussed that briefly. What kind of system do you have in your county? Um, is anyone here not from Texas? No, everyone here is from Texas. I I believe that there are a lot of people from outside of Texas today. Oh, look at that: Indiana, from, Colorado, Tennessee, Kentucky, Florida, Virginia, Mexico. Great! Wow. Okay, uh, Miss uh, Shannon, can you please uh, let me know um, what it is that you have in your county? Uh, Marco, can you ask questions through Zoom or no? Sure, you can. Um, we can ask them questions and they can unmute their mics and reply or they can type it in the chat. Okay, so I see in the chat. So uh, it seems that in Kentucky, they have the coroner system. And this is what Ms. Ms. Shannon replied uh, to the question. Yeah. So we do have people from Spain. That's great. Maryland. Okay. So as, you, as I could show you, yeah, a lot of them are replying that they have the coroner system. So think about that. And then could you spot potential conflicts of interest if the county sheriff is also the coroner? Could there be any potential conflicts of interest? Can anyone tell me what that would be? Absolutely, because the sheriff is going to, I'm sorry to just bump in. No, Jeff. please, please. please <laughs> sorry. Please. Um, so it's yeah, okay. <laughs> so I do feel like there would be some conflict of interest, especially if the, if the sheriff is wanting to build a case. That's just what I say. Exactly. And imagine that this is a case of people who have died under police custody or because of police violence. Yeah. And it is the sheriff who gets to decide whether or not an, investig an autopsy should be conducted. Mm. There was a case, there was a blatant case, and I think this is actually happening in Georgia, of a suspect who was fleeing the scene was finally caught on by the police during a car chase. And the police shot the car um, multiple times. And then in order to get rid of the evidence, they set the car on fire. So the body was not only had bullet wounds, but it was also, you know, calcium. And the sheriff said that it was an accident. Because the sheriff decided it was an accident, there was no criminal investigation conducted and there was no autopsy report done. So this is part of, it's almost like, a, okay, well, let's not get into much into politics, but, but you can tell why this is, this is a conflict of interest and why like a lot of these jurisdictions, well, you know, how do you decide, you know, if it's something that happened under the police or, or in police custody or, uh, and especially someone who doesn't have that kind of training. You know? So it, it, it is an issue. I'm just going to leave it at that, that it is an issue. Uh, let me see. I think a couple other people reply in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Here they are separate, but both are elected officials in Kentucky. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like Latin America. I don't know, Carmita. Apparently Latin America is a little bit more, uh, more advanced. Let's, let's see what the... Okay, so when is an autopsy report written? So in the United States, again, these are numbers of 2017, and I do need to tell you that the COVID uh, pandemic changed these numbers. But in 2017, there are about 2.8 million annual deaths in the United States. So of course, you don't get to do an autopsy report for all these deaths. The coroner or the medical examiner decides 
depending on the system that you have, whether or not there will be an autopsy report. Um, the body is the property of the next of kin. So make sure you always designate a next of kin in your will or any kind of legal documents. Um, but this is uh, overwritten written by the state in cases of violent deaths, suspicious deaths, unnatural deaths, and unattended deaths. And we'll talk a little more about those requirements uh, in the next slides. But uh, ideally, um, only the next of kin could request a, an autopsy report, but they will have to pay for it. They will, it will have to come from their own pocket unless it is the state, the one who's re requesting it, and the state takes care of the autopsy report. And of course, uh, those are the four, the four circumstances, violent, suspicious, unnatural, and unattended deaths. It is mandatory uh, in very specific circumstances, such as fire deaths, especially the CO level, um, carbon monoxide level was below 20%, which means uh, it is significant, but something else could have happened. So imagine that, uh, like the, the, what I told you about the car that was incinerated with the body inside, you know, you have to determine whether that body died because of the fire or because of something else. So if it's below 20%, then you gotta do an autopsy. Uh, homicides, apparent suicides with a clear intent, um, because sometimes suicides happen under suspicious circumstances. Drivers in single car accidents, you know, uh, pilots in aircraft crashes, occupational related deaths. You can see how this is so um, uh, important for other, to establish uh, uh, Law cases, at witness accidents, accidents unrelated to disease, in cases of civil litigation, such as negligence or malpractice, uh, deaths of persons in custody, and um, unexpected deaths of children, especially children under two years old. Okay, let me see. Who else can order an autopsy report? The prosecuting attorney uh, can order an autopsy report, the county health officer, especially if they are um, like a pandemic, for instance, to trying to find out there any, any other um, issues going on, a certain court judge or a family or next of kin, like I explained before. Um, for instance, um, another thing that I forgot to mention is that this is also how we found out about the opioid uh, epidemic going on in the Midwest because a lot of, this is when a lot of the um, autopsies were revealing all these chemicals in the bodies and otherwise, you know, they didn't, they look suspicious. And so that's how they found out about that particular epidemic. So what is the purpose of an autopsy report? It documents the manner and cause of death. It established a criminal investigation. Uh, so uh, there are legal consequences, for instance, related to insurance or testament. Um, for instance, you cannot collect life insurance, like the next of kin cannot collect life insurance until they present a death certificate. Well, it turns out you need an autopsy report. Sometimes you might need an autopsy report for a death certificate. So if your loved one died in suspicious circumstances and there was an autopsy um, that was ordered, you, you need that for the death certificate. And if you don't have the death certificate, you don't get to collect the life insurance. And sometimes it can take a very, very, very long time, up to six months. Imagine not having any sort of financial, uh, um, um, any sort of financial support after you last your loved one, because you still don't have that, that death certificate. Uh, there are also epidemiological consequences, like I mentioned, a lot of new diseases, new trends in substance abuse, defective products, all that comes from these uh, autopsy reports. So as you can see, I think that I've established how important they are for things that you may not have even considered. You know? And so it, it, is, it is a very, very, very important document. So this is why the, the person who gets to author it and the person who, um, who gets to write in and, and who gets to have this access to this information is very important. 
This is from the state of Indiana and uh, the, train, the coroner's training board, because after they get elected, they do need to take uh, an exam, but believe me, it is quite easy. It is multiple choice. And again, it depends on the county. Anyone can do it, but this is the kind of list that they tell them when an autopsy report should be ordered or, or the function of an autopsy report. And as long as they do all those things, then it is done. Um, but notice one of the things they do is establish order of death when more than one family member was killed, obtain toxicological specimens, correlate wounds with weapons, rule out disease or other public health concerns. Uh, you need training for all these things. This requires specialized training. And if it's the coroner doing all this, then, uh, um, like I said, you know, there, there are some issues with that. So let's say they ask you to translate a, an autopsy report. So let's build our translation brief. So the client could be an attorney. It can be a government. They give you the autopsy report for translation. Uh, who gets to be the audience? Well, it can be sent to other authorities. For instance, a lot of the um, autopsy reports that are translated, they were going from Arizona into uh, places, different authorities in Mexico. Uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, related legal proceedings or, or, or other legal actions such as um, like requesting uh, a suspect from, from Mexico or extradition purposes, for instance. So this is why I was doing from English into Spanish. And the purpose is to share information so everybody's on the same page, how, how the case is going, how the, how the murder actually happened, how the circumstances and all that. So this is why they might ask you to translate an autopsy report, you know, just to share information with non-English speakers or whatever language direction you, you, you're doing it. Uh, I never got one from Mexico. Uh, I always got them all from the United States going into Mexican Spanish, but it can go both ways, of course. What are the associated competencies? Professional competencies. You need to understand ethics. You need to understand workflow. You know, what happens after this? Who you get it from? What is, where's it going? What kind of editing is it involved? What kind of uh, legal, uh, what kind of terminology research is involved? All that is part of your professional competencies. Text your competencies. You need to understand different styles of writing, especially formatting across countries. The way we write it in Mexico is a little bit different than in the United States. Uh, languages, you need to be competent in different uh, language formatting, you know, not just commas and periods and question marks, but also how the numbers are written, how some of the um, scientific conventions are written. And also remember cultures. Uh, there's also a lot of cultural component in, in these documents because, um, I mean, death is a huge part of culture. And so it is reflected in, in these documents one way or the other. Uh, for instance, how they, how they frame the death, how they frame the murder, how they frame who's responsible, all that is it's very important in these documents. Terminological competence, specialized words or terms. You need to do a lot of research. And, and if you are a legal translator, all of a sudden you're very comfortable with legal terminology, but all of a sudden you are bombarded with all this an anatomic anatomy related um, terminology. You need to do a lot of research. You need to understand that, you know, you know what you're talking about. Like uh, the hyoid, the hyoid bone, for instance. Like, you know, this little bone we have on under here. Um, you got to know where it is. What's its function? How to describe it? How to describe anything that happened to it? This is all terminology research. And then, of course, research competencies. You know, know where to find the answers that Google Translate is just not enough sometimes. So <laughs> you need to be able to go deep into uh, glossaries, go, go into uh, journals, go into uh, medical journals, go into all kinds of um, other, other tools in order to make sure that you, what you're translating is well backed with uh, research. Do you have some questions in the next slide? I do. Why do you think ethics are essential when translating an autopsy report? Who can tell me that? Feel free to type it in the chat or you can also uh, speak on the mic. Why are ethics part of this? Why are even ethics part of translation anyway? No one? I have an idea. 
Okay, Marco. I think um, there are many different ways you can translate the same text. There's different uh, nuances you can convey. You can slant it depending on your perspective. And if you are if you are biased to one side or the other in a criminal case, then um, your translation can reflect that, whether or not it was intentional. Yeah, exactly. In a, in a court setting, ethics are important. We have ethics canon that we have to follow. We have to stay impartial. We have to uh, also, we, we have the, the accuracy canon. We have to mm -hmm. make sure that what we're doing, we don't translate, but we interpret. So if, if a forensic report comes in our hand, or if a medical examiner is testifying, we have to know what we're talking about when we are interpreting for a jury in a criminal case. Exactly. And I, and I really wanted to emphasize that because when we talk about ethics, we are very familiar with interpreter ethics. When it comes to interpreting, we, we have a very clear, I mean, it's part of your accreditation. It's part of your test when you become an interpreter. But we rarely talk about translation ethics. And, and we assume that they're just going to transfer on into the translation world. But a lot of people who are translators are, are not interpreters and they only work with written documents and they, they, the, the requirements or, or rather um, that idea of having behaving ethically may not come into place because they're just dealing with documents, not dealing with people. So, but, but you're, totally, you're totally right. Those, those ethical standards should translate, pun intended, into translation because the, the, you are exposed to a lot of sensitive information and you're, imposed, you're exposed to information before it becomes public, before it becomes official. Absolutely. And, so and if, if you're translating for a legal setting, you have to be ethical about it. Right, so a couple of people in the chat, yeah, that that person has privacy, exactly. So you need to remember that not only do they have privacy, but also the next of kin have privacy. Uh, the translation is to be neutral, of course, because you're dealing with confidential information of the disease, exactly. So remember privacy, remember uh, confidential information. Um, how can autopsy reports from Mexico and the United States be different? Can you guys think of any? besides the languages. What do you guys think? Um, I, I think, hi, sorry, I jumped in. No one else was saying anything. Uh, I jumped in. Uh, well, I think the format, the amount of detail, um, usually is Spanish documents are way more detailed and have a lot of language and they are very formal. Yep. Um, yeah, sometimes even the process might be different, you know, how specimens were collected, who, who collected them, but you're totally right. They're a lot more detailed and sometimes they're written in, in a narrative. You're going to get a narrative, you're going to get a story, whereas in a lot of the English or the United States documents, they might be like maybe not bullet points, but very succinct, very, very, very brief. Whereas in the Mexican documents, you will get uh, a narrative story. And so you need to be familiar with that. That, um, For instance, I don't know if you, ever, if you have ever translated birth certificates from Central America. In Central America, the partidas, you get an actual narrative. You know, I mean, you don't get to know when how the parents met and all that, but basically you almost do. You get to see whether, and it's all written down. Whereas in other countries, United States or Mexico, we get lines and we get blanks and people just input the information. So there are different styles for of legal legal documents. If you let me check the chat real quick. Yes, yeah, statistics collection, the dissertation, yeah, rules and regulations. Yes. Uh, can I add yeah. only one thing? As an Arabic or a Muslim interpreter, I think we need to respect the religion of the victim or the murder. I mean, we can add something which it will not impact the main idea of the report, but the, the kin or the family of the dead person will see that we are uh, respect their victim. So religion issue should be there. I mean, we, we can add some words which it will not, as I said, the context, but it will be most respectable. 
I wonder how that will work. I, I mean, I think definitely uh, um, Muslim countries probably have like their own way of doing it as well, their own way of phrasing. So that would be very interesting for Arabic, English, English, Arabic uh, translators. Um, yeah. And some people are also saying that uh, a lot of a lot of authors reports may have uh, a specific uh, um, data collection questions, such as whether or not the disease was a smoker, whether or not um, uh, obesity, things like that, to report to the, the health offices. If you were to translate a, an autopsy report, uh, what kind of questions would you ask the client? If you could ask the client a question, the, uh, what would be some good questions to ask? What do you think? Hi, this is Jesse again. So the question is, if we are going to translate an autopsy report and what questions would we have for the client? Yeah, usually when you get a translation assignment, you should yeah. probably ask the client a few questions. Shit, 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 shit. I would ask, um, what is the purpose of the document? Like who's gonna be reading this document? What are you needing it for? Okay. Um, I feel like I would wanna know that like, is this for, I don't know, an insurance company that you need to send this to? Is this for a legal reason? I mean, of course, insurance and is legal, but I, I would want to know that is this going to be sitting in the courtroom. Is this going to be seen by an insurance provider? Um, is this going to be maybe something that goes to another country? I mean, that's something that I would want to know. Yeah, those are important questions. Remember, you should always ask your client questions about anything that might help you translate the document better or where you should focus uh, the most research because that's going to be that's going to be very important. Who will receive the translated documents? What is the purpose for what country? That's very important too. Which countries are going to? Uh, you know what we call the locale. Which locale is going to? The purpose and country. Um, I want to share something that one of your one of the attendees shared with the chat. Uh, Miss Akiko, I'm going to share your story. Uh, she said she had received a personal medical history from an unfamiliar translation company asking if anyone can translate it. It was sent out to multiple people. That was a really ethical issue. Yes, the company should not be sending out these documents just like that. And that is very, very, very um, worrisome that it actually happened. Um, thank you for sharing this, Akiko. So it's, an, it's a multidisciplinary record. It's gonna have legal terminology. It's gonna have medical and scientific terminology. It's going to have forensic terminology and toxicology. And so these are the components of an autopsy report. We're going to have the first two parts are going to be the legal component. And then the last uh, four parts are going to be the medical component. The legal component has a front page or summary, which is what many times the authorities are the only thing that they read. And then you have the documentation. I'll explain that in a little bit. The medical component has the external examination the wounds and injuries, the internal examination, and the toxicological examination. I'm gonna go through all these in, in a little more detail, so hang in tight. The legal component is the front page or summary. It's going to tell you the name, the age, the sex of the decedent, the autopsy number, the date, the time, the physician, the prosecutor that is related to that county office, and if, and if there's an assistant too. The persons who usually press an examination besides the, the the person realizing, uh, performing it, are representatives of the police department and sometimes also the DA's office. And normally they just witness what's going on. They should not participate in the um, examination itself. Um, so they're going to list the anatomic findings and the pathological diagnosis. They're listed so that the cause of death is listed first or what is deemed to be the most significant uh, factor that contributed to, to the person's death. There's a cause and manner of death, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. And then there's a signature of the pathologist or the person who conducted the, the report. And that's usually just the front page. And many times that's what people just read that unless they, have, they wanna go into detail, but that's normally what's being used. You also have documentation. So uh, you're going to include in the circumstantial summary, what do authorities know happened before death. So they might say, uh, this person died after 
receiving gunshot wounds from this other person. And they will be named. Um, how was the body uh, obtained? Who ordered the autopsy? Their names and titles. So all this is included in the documentation. Uh, sometimes you might even have a, a chain of custody included in this particular in this particular um, section. Then the extermination, uh, external examination is done. Uh, you're going to describe how the body was received and under, under what condition. Um, the clothing, you're going to describe all the clothing, accessories, watches, jewelry, etc. Uh, you're going to have the external examination of the body. You're going to list the ethnicity, race, sex, age, weight, height, decomposition stage. And we'll talk about the decomposition stage at the end of the presentation. Hair, uh, pupil dilation, etc. cetera. Uh, identifying marks and scars. So here you, you have, um, in this particular uh, drawing, you have a 16 inch staple incision. Uh, you have clear plastic surgical tubing, uh, multi-lumen vascular catheter. So you have all these things that are you can just perceive from the outside of the body. Any evidence of therapy, so any sort of um, you know correct surgery or something like that. Um, quick question: Why would anyone look into uh, pupil dilation? as part of the examination. Does anyone know? Drugs. Drugs could be a good one. Yeah. Uh, blunt um, hit on the head. You know, when you have a concussion before passing, you could, your pupils change when you're, you hit your head. Good. And we're going to see one more um, reason why in the next, um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, Someone asked me about chain of custody. Uh, basically, it's just how, who received the body, from where it was collected, where did it go before it ended up in the, in the coroner's uh, office or medical examiner's office. Wounds and injuries. Uh, this particular drawing shows uh, uh, bullet wounds. Uh, number and location. Each of them are detailed separately. So you're going to find a lot of paragraphs. Bullet wound number one. Uh, I mean, gunshot wound number one. Gunshot wound number two, number three, number four, etc. Uh, any sort of the weapons, especially uh, if they were collected from the same scene, what kind of um, what kind of wounds? Were they gunshot bullets? Um, exit entrance and exit wounds. Recovery locations, because sometimes they are collected from a different part of the body that that they enter. Related pathologies such as hemorrhage or con concussions. Um, Concussion, sorry, I misspelled that. Uh, disposal and delivery of evidence. You're going to collect fingernail clippings, uh, blood, the clothes, trace evidence, bullets and fragments, hair near the wounds. Even if they're stabbing wounds, you're still going to collect hair around that area. You're gonna label all that and then you're gonna send it somewhere else for, for, for to preserve the evidence. So this is all your responsibility as the person conducting the autopsy. Uh, not just detailing all of this, but also collecting evidence for future use. Then uh, there's the internal examination. Before you get open up the body, you should probably look at other areas uh, in the head, the scalp, the skull, the brain, if there's any trauma. In the neck, you're really going to look for the hyoid bone uh, and also the larynx. But does anyone know why the hyoid bone it's so important in an autopsy report. To see if there's been translation or any kind of blunt force trauma to the neck that impairs breathing. Okay, okay, and what, what can that tell us? What can that, what can the, um, damage the hyoid bone, what can that tell us? If it's a natural cause of death or if it was foul play. Exactly. And uh, usually this particular bone is it's damaged the most during strangulation. So if the person was strangulated, you know, that damaged that bone on the sides. Also, sometimes when the person um, hangs themselves, like, like suicide, you know, but from what I understand, the damage to how higher bone is different, whether strangulation or whether it is um, uh, suicide by hanging. And there was a whole 
scan no, no, there was a whole uh, I wouldn't start a conspiracy theory but there was a whole I guess issue with uh, I don't know I don't know if you guys remember Jeffrey uh, Epstein yeah that's what came to my mind when you were talking about because one of the issues that they had was the amount of damage that was <clears throat> to the thoracic area in correlation with was it suicide or was it an actual strangulation? Like, was it foul play, basically? Exactly. So, so there you go. So this is why this bone is particularly important. And so they're going to put a lot of emphasis on this bone because so this, it can tell, you know, whether that apparent suicide was really apparent, you know, so be mindful of that. So a few questions on the chat. Yeah, okay, so they're all saying strangulation, perfect. Uh, so now you get to open up the body and you look at the, some of the common autopsy incisions. Uh, the one that um, uh, when I was younger during my undergrad years, we went to the we went to the medical examiner's office here in Harris County and they showed us an autopsy. Uh, it was definitely not for the weak of heart, but I, I witnessed the Y ship incision. They basically open use a Y and then they use the skin flap to cover the, the head and then they're able to to look at the organs, have access to all the, the internal organs. Uh, you also have uh, the modified white shape incision and then the eye shape incision. So you get to cut the body up. You're gonna look at the cardiovascular system, especially any, any indication of atherosclerosis. You're going to weight the heart because that's gonna tell you a lot about, you know, the cardiovascular system. Uh, you're gonna weight the lungs. You're gonna notice if there are any obstructions uh, the hepo hepatovillary system, I'm going to weight the liver, you're going to look for calculi, any obstructions in the, in the, in the organ, uh, because again, these are all can lead to death, right? Notice the word obstruction. The digestive system, you're going to look at food material, you're going to collect, you know, in the case of poisoning, for instance, uh, food material, tablets, any capsules, uh, for instance, in the case of drug overdose, you're going to note for ulcers, uh, external and internal section of organs. You're going to cut them up and look not just the contents, but also like inside the, the, how, how, how it looks, the, the organ. Uh, Genitourinary system, the way of the kidneys, any obstructions, any urine content. You, go, you wanna, want to collect all that and also analyze all that. Um, there are also musculoskeletal systems. You're going to, you may have uh, for instance, uh, in the case of fractures, um, and also the, the diaphragm, right, which is right below. Uh, remember, the diaphragm controls breathing. So anything that happens to the diaphragm compromises uh, your, your breathing. Now that you actually uh, look at the um, internal organs, you get to do the toxicological examination. And it's almost like separate from the autopsy report because it starts all over again. And then, but it's, it's part of it. It's almost like, like, a, like an appendix, almost like a, like a, like a second part. Again, the case number, the decedent, the date submitted, report date, all that. What you're basing your specimens uh, from, such as the vitreous body, the bile, the pleural blood, that's blood from, from the lungs, urine, gastric contents and the name of the medical examiner. You're going to list the results by different uh, liquids, different substances, by the vitreous, the plural blood, and the urine. Uh, does anyone know what the vitreous is? Where, where, um, where do we find the, the vitreous uh, liquid or the vitreous humor? Sometimes it's called the vitreous humor. Where do we find it? Does anyone know? I do. In the Eyes. In the eye, exactly. It's it's this little thing in the eye. And sometimes with age, uh, well, a lot of things happen with age, but one of the things that happen with age is that the vitreous humor sometimes can liquefy, and then all of a sudden your your you can have um your your retina can become detached, and that's a whole different issue. But does anyone know why we look we look we look at this vitreous humor or this vitreous liquid in an autopsy report? Why can it tell us? It can tell you the condition of the health of the person. It can. What else? And also, if there's any, I guess, the levels of toxicity in their body. Okay, sure. Any, anything. You're going definitely in the right direction. 
anything else? Let me look at the chat. Um, I don't know. After that, I don't know much. <laughs> You're looking about the eye, inside the eye. Yeah, okay, okay. We're looking about the eye. So it turns out that the vitreous liquid is the one it resists uh, decomposition the longest. It's, it stays without being decomposed the longest. And as it remains in the, in, in, in the body, in the dead body, it starts collecting potassium. And so the levels of potassium in the vitreous liquid can re really help you establish the time of death. Because it correlates, the, the, the potassium contents correlate with when the person died. Mm -hmm. And so by looking at that potassium contents, you can pretty much establish even within the hour, mm -hmm. within the hour when the person so died. The hour of death, you can establish as close as to the hour of death. Uh, more or less. Like, real yeah. close. Like real close. Ah, okay. And that's just by looking at the, you said the vitreous. protein deposits in the vitreous? Mm -hmm. The potassium deposits in the vitreous. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. So this is why it's very important. Now, I don't know if a coroner actually knows this, but this is why this is such a specialized uh, document and such a specialized uh, profession. Uh, okay. Then you list the positive results first, because that's what I was interested in. You know, what kind of drugs were there? What kind of liquid, you know, what, what happened there? And then anything that's negative, you list at second. You're going to test for many substances, including ethanol, methanol, isopropanol, acetone, fensacodine, cocaine, methadone, morphine, codeine, benzodiazepines, antihistamines, tricyclic antidepressants, methamphetamine, and amphetamine. Uh, you may test for something else, depending on any other circumstances of death, but these are the issues. Those of you who look at these substances can tell these are mostly related to alcohol, or related to other drugs. So for instance, acetone can tell you whether the person um, drank themselves to death. Mm. You know, some people that are alcoholics, they may end up drinking other things that are not uh, alcohol. Oh. They may end up drinking rubbing alcohol, for instance. Yeah, I've heard so that. Acetone can, can tell you information about that. Uh, right. So, for instance, morphine, coding, methadone, all that, those are all drugs. Um, I think benzo, benzodiazepines are used, if I'm not mistaken, they're kinds of antidepressants. That is correct. And I apologize. I am a medical assistant. I've been medical. Oh, please help us. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. Benzo, yeah. Um, benzodiazepines, those are, um, those are antidepressants. And then, I don't know if everybody knows, but antihistamines are for allergies or allergic re reactions. Correct. So all of that information uh, can tell us about, um, right. So all this information can, can, can be gained from looking at these substances, right? It can, and so, you know, all of a sudden you have a, a you know, a strangulation with some rope, and then you have that the person was taking antidepressants, or high, high um, quantities of alcohol, you can pretty much establish the, the story of what happened there. They may or may not include a microscopic examination of tissue. Uh, I know that for instance, with a lot of head injuries, they do a lot of microscopic examination of tissue because they want to see, for instance, how damaged the brain was. And, and that, that is important. For instance, when football players die because of a concussion, they're, um, oh, I'm running out of time, uh, that, that they will do an examination of tissue. For the last part of the presentation, I wanted to give you a few terms. Uh, this is for Spanish, but I think those of you who don't know Spanish can also benefit from this because you can tell how there are a lot of challenges or equivalents depending on the target language and depending on the country where this translation is going to. So for instance, the main issue is how are we going to translate coroner, medical examiner, forensic pathologist? Because they all mean different things. They all have different qualifications. And yet these careers don't exist in many Latin American countries, for instance. So for, uh, or they don't make that distinction. So in Spain, a medical forense is a civil servant who works for the Department of Justice. And it's generally a doctor plus four years of forensic training. That is quite a long career to, to do an autopsy report. And I think there are, there's a few people here from Spain, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. 
In Mexico, you have a pathologist forense who's also a service servant who works in the Department of Justice, sometimes usually at the state level. And again, it's a doctor with training. What I've seen that a lot of documents translate all these three, you know, if, if it's not clear whether it's a uh, pathologist forense or medical forense, most of them translate coroner as just forense, at forense. And that's kind of how they avoid being specific about the qualifications of the coroner. I'm not happy with this translation. Uh, if you guys can think about the translations, uh, please feel free to suggest them. Cause of death. And this is the reason why this is a, an issue is because it's a it has legal weight. It, it's, it's a legal term that has weight. This is the underlying disease or injury that is specific and immediate medical reason for death. Uh, so for instance, it can be cirrhosis uh, caused, followed by conditions that led to that event, like chronic ethanol abuse. So it was the cirrhosis that was the main thing that uh, caused his death. Uh, they can also list significant non-contributing medical conditions um, that could be causes of death, uh, such as cancer or, or any other major, major disease, major illness. This is translated as causa or causas de la muerte, depending how many are listed there. Manner of death, this is how the person died. And this is usually a one word description. You're gonna have natural death, accident, suicide, homicide, undetermined, and pending. Uh, this is translated as modelo or tipo de defunción. But I think those of you who are translating into other languages, I think now you can see how you need to differentiate between cause and manner because they, they are different things. And so, you know, be careful with that when you translate into other languages. Decedent. This is a legal term. This is the dead person and it's, it's a legal term. Usually uh, in Mexico, uh, one of the cultural things that we do Sometimes they use finado, uh, but also cadaver. Cadaver is, it would be a, a very universal term. Cadaver refers to any, any kind of um, the body of a dead person that is not buried, you know, that is not on the ground. Um, but there are other, the, in Mexico at least, we have a slight different uh, terms for different kinds of bodies. So difunto, it's the body of a person who died by natural cause. Oxiso is the body from a violent death, but not homicide. So vehicular manslaughter, electrocution, anything that was, that was violent. And interfecto is body from a violent death, specifically from criminal actions, such as murder. So you have all of these different, very, very specific term, terms when it comes to decedent, depending on the target language. Uh, crossly, this is just something that gave me trouble in the beginning. It just means obviously at first sight. In Mexico, it's macroscopicamente o a primera vista. Uh, this is such a Latin term. It's, it's very uh, high register versus grossly in, in the English. Unremarkable means ordinary or normal. Simply, no presenta ninguna normalidad. These are all terms you're going to find in the autopsy report. And then finally, we have artifacts. Artifacts, you would think it would be artifactos, but really artifacts re refers to any body modifications that happen because of death or medical care or anything that, that happened, uh, post-mortem care, putrefaction, for instance. During putrefaction, you have greening. The, the skin can turn a little green. It can marble. The skin can slip. It can detach from the tissue. And also bloating. You know, they will eat the, a lot of bodies, you know, they, they would tend to load up because of uh, the gas content inside the body. How we translate this would be alteraciones de la putrefacción. That would be the term for artifacts. And then you have different kinds, enverdecimiento, grisura, también llamado lividez, la piel se recae, el cuerpo se hincha. We have many different uh, um, stages of death. And actually, I think I have them in the next slide. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so you have polymorphies. That's just when the body becomes just pale. Um, apparently, this is more evident in in white uh, in in the in white bodies, I guess, uh, bodies from white people. Uh, they just become super pale. Uh, cooling. 
the body reaches basically the temperature cools down to temperature to the to a, a room temperature stiffening rigor mortis the it becomes too stiff liver mortis the settling of the blood of the blood inside the organ but also uh, depending on how the body is laying, you can see there. Oh, I'm running out of time. Decomposition is for when a putrefaction is when the decomposition of proteins. Decomposition is all the other organic matter. And then finally, skeletonization, but only the bones remain. And so I did have an activity for you. Uh, I think Marco sent you the, the text to translate. Um, you can, I guess you can do that on your own. But um, you know, I hope you can use all these terms that we use and that all the all the tips and all the guidance that I gave you to translate a, a, an autopsy report, or at least you're not so afraid of it now. Uh, you can approach it with a little bit more confidence. It does require a lot of terminology research. Uh, there's a lot of issues still with terminology depending on your on your language combination, um, but it, 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 I think it helps to understand where it is located in the autopsy report, what function does it have, whether it's a toxicological examination, whether it is the external examination, the internal examination, whether it's the, the summary of the report. And so the activity that I had for you, and I hope you can do this on your own, um, you know, just do that in your language pair, but then also discuss any issues or terminology that you might have. And I'll finish this presentation with a quote from Voltaire. To the living, we owe respect, but to the dead, we owe only the truth. And so ah, nice. with that, I conclude. I know there's a lot of uh, comments on the chat. I guess I can look at them now. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Very thank you, thank, thank you. you. This is very informational. Um, I, for one, I really appreciate it. I've learned a lot and I hope that we keep having, you know, these type of webinars, I really enjoy them. And thanks, y'all. Appreciate y'all. I, I, hope, I hope, again, you know, I hope this helped you one way or the other. I hope, again, like every every document has its own little world, its own little universe. And, and, and you know, and as a translators, you know, we get to have access uh, to these different worlds and we, we can become experts, again, through experience and, and through the correct uh, feedback that we get from there. But yeah. I really appreciate it. It's been very, very helpful. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm a medical interpreter. Um, so this really hits home. And so I, I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this. And so anything to do with medical, I'm gonna be on. And I really appreciate y'all doing this because it's very helpful for us. Y'all keep doing what y'all doing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So I think Mark, if you didn't receive the activity, I think Mark will can send it to you. And if not, you can also email me. I think I have my email in my first slide, but... Um, I'll include the document when I email all the attendees too. Okay. And also I think Marco already recorded this. So you make this available on YouTube as well. Yes. Okay. So if you guys, if I was going too fast for you guys to take notes or anything, uh, you can watch it on your own piece. Ray, could you tell uh, That would be wonderful. Thank could you. you tell us a little bit more about the translation and interpretation programs at University of Houston? University of Houston downtown. It's a, it's a different campus. We are we are on we're on. Oh, okay, that's how so, we're here in Dallas. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have uh, different initiatives. We have first of all on Saturday mornings we have training for medical and court interpreters uh, only on Saturdays. Uh, so for like it's customary for for court interpreters forty hour training for medical forty eight hour training. And that's done through continuing education. Then for credit, uh, we have uh, undergrad programs. We have uh, four minors. We have a minor in translation, medical translation, legal translation, and general translation. And then we have a minor in interpreting. And we have the Spanish degree. And as of yesterday, I just got approval from Martin to start a Spanish, uh, Spanish translation BA that is going to focus only from English into Spanish. So okay. most programs in the country are done from Spanish or any language, French, et cetera, into English. Our program will be different because we'll be focusing to serve the Hispanic population, to, to train better access in Spanish to the people, the, the, the people who need it here in, in the United States. So any questions about any of those programs, uh, please feel free to, uh, Email me. I, I I have my 
interest in all those programs and, and I coordinate a lot of those programs. So please let me know. Do you have any other language besides Spanish? No, unfortunately, no. We we uh, we are we uh, our our modern languages department is is very small, and so Spanish is the main language. Uh, so we don't really have that. But Miss uh, Dorocher, um, there is um, I believe HCC. They have Houston Community College. They have an associate in translation and interpreting, and for that one, it can be any combination. So contact them at HCC, and I'm sure they can guide you the, the right way. And there are programs in Austin and Dallas-Fort Worth as well for other languages or language neutral. I just put a, a link in the chat, which has sort of a directory of all the different translation and interpretation programs around the state. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful, thank you. Okay. Well, I know this was not a very light topic for a Saturday morning, but thank you for coming. And, and I, 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 like I was telling Marco, I was getting a little existential every time I do this presentation because it makes you think about death and it's not, not a pleasant thought, but, you know, c'est la vie. Part of life. It's part of life, you know. We exactly. just got to make the best of it every day. <laughs> exactly. More tacos. Okay. As a court so, interpreter, I hear yeah, that I fun, a lot. I so, yeah. And I do remember uh, we had a speaker talk about vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and I do remember when I was translating these documents, I was getting vicarious trauma. And it's just a document. I wasn't talking to a victim. I wasn't interpreting for a victim. I wasn't interpreting for in, in a patient medical situation. It was just a paper document. Yet I was quite a chicken. <laughs> in 2018, we did a, a, a murder trial. It was actually a death penalty case that lasted seven weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was it was gruesome. The, the young girl, the 16 year old had been killed in, in a rather gruesome manner. And her body had been left in the woods in Florida in August. So just imagine. So vicarious trauma i i can tell yeah. you about it yeah certainly yeah wow yeah, it okay uh if there are no more other questions uh marco oh. okay thank you so much this has been very useful and uh, if anybody wants to tune in next week at the same time saturday afternoon we'll be having a presentation on site translation of Documents for a Workers Comp by Edgar Hidalgo Garcia, who's a court interpreter and medical interpreter and a translation interpretation instructor in California associated with the training company Trans Interpreting. And he'll be our guest presenter then. So it'll be um, language neutral. There may be some Spanish examples like today, but um, you're welcome to come no matter what your working languages are. Right. Then. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thanks Dr. Very. Romero. Great. Bye, Marco. Bye, everybody. Bye, Thank Dr. you. Bye, Dr. Romero. Bye, Marco. It was great to see you guys. You too. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Glad to hear it. How do I get the link for next week? I will email the link for next week to everybody who signed up for today. So you'll get that probably on Monday. Thank Marco, you. I'll, let you, I'll let you end the call because I think if I end it, then every, everything shuts down. So.